Good day, leaders. I'm Dr. Sujay Walia, and we continue our conversation about building a high-performance team. Today, we're going to focus on group dynamics, starting with when the teams are formed up to the point that they are performing. How do we move a team from that stage of anxiety and uncertainty to that point where they're a high-performing team? What are the different stages of group dynamics? That is what we'll be talking about today. So we'll look at the two um, theories, the one, the model that was developed by Tuckman and Blanchard, which are pretty much similar in terms of, of what they say and what happens at each stage of group development. So first is forming or orientation. The Tuckman calls it forming, Blanchard calls it orientation. The second is storming or dissatisfaction. The third is norming or integration. And the fourth is performing or production. And I'm going to go into greater detail with each stage of group development, of team formation, of team, de team development, and what the dynamic is. So let's talk about forming first. That's the initial stage when the group is new, they've just come together, or maybe you had a group before and you've introduced a new member and they're little agreement things have changed maybe your company went through a restructuring or something like that and what happens at this stage of of um the team is that there's little agreement on what the goal is what the aims are what the vision is what the purpose is individuals aren't clear about what they are supposed to do and what their responsibilities are what their deliverables are what they're supposed to be held accountable for very often processes are just completely ignored people just skip over things and when you have all of this happening in your team you get high anxiety among your team members and evidently low trust right because persons just don't know what to do and then these individuals who are new now start to test the boundary imagine you have um, little children and they're put together and they're in a new class and they don't know the teacher, they don't know the other students very well, they don't know their capabilities. They start to test, they start to push the boundaries to see what they can get away with. Well, it's a similar concept when you have a new team and they're unclear about what is required of them and what is needed from them as individuals and what they are supposed to be bringing to this team. So while they're excited to be a part of this team and this new direction, sometimes, not always, but most times they're excited, there's a little anxiety about what is really expected of us. So in this role, there's a lot of dependence on the leader. The leader is being looked to for direction where do we go? What are we supposed to be doing? Why are we here together? So the leader needs to be direct and to provide guidance on the purpose of the team, as well as clarity on the values that this team will need to espouse in order to achieve the goals. What are these goals? What are the norms? What is the expected behavior that we would like to see happen? What are the processes that we're going to do in terms of decision making in, in, and other things in terms of how we communicate? What are the, the steps? So it has to be very directive at, at the first step at the onset of the team um, in terms of procedures, accountability, practices, roles and responsibility, those things the leader has to tell, has to direct, has to give very clear instructions and guidance. And then how do we share our knowledge and our skill set? We don't know each other. It's like we're in a new class. So I don't know what you bring to the table. You don't know what I bring to the table as a member of this team and what skill set is needed in order for this project, for this whatever it is that we're doing to be successful, for us to be a successful team. So the leader has to really make all of these things clear early in the formation, in the orientation stage of the, of the team. And you know, you can expect that there's going to be anxiety, there's going to be uncertainty. When the leader is giving clarity and direction about roles and responsibilities, values, purpose, norms, expected behaviors, processes and procedures for communication, for decision making and those kinds of things, what the leader is doing is laying a foundation for trust initially and ultimately for productivity, for the team to be able to perform at its best. 
The second stage in the team development, we call it storming or dissatisfaction. And this is where we have individuals vying for power. There's a power struggle in this stage. It's where persons, they want to be more independent of the leader. They have an idea about what the roles are and the goals and responsibilities and the deliverables, but now they're trying to make their mark. So there is this struggle for attention and for decision-making authority. You know, they're trying to prove themselves. And in this stage, we also have a bit of tension because there is an expectation of performance and what persons are expected to deliver. But the reality is because we're not cohesive as a team, we're not meeting these expectations. And so there's a low morale in the group, in the team members, in terms of how they feel about themselves and what they're bringing to the team. You also have the issue of confusion and frustration because as persons are jockeying and jostling for these power positions and these leadership positions and, you know, the authority and the attention, you have um, blaming and finger pointing and persons may be aggressive in how they deal with conflict and how they interact with their team members. And when others are being aggressive, you have others yet on the team who are withdrawing, who are pulling into themselves because that's just not who they are and they don't really get into that. And then as you have the aggressors and those that are withdrawing and persons are trying to make their mark and there's this jostle for power, you have little coalitions, little pockets of people that are siding with each other. And in this role, the leader now needs to coach and to guide persons and guide the team along in the process. So they're not as directive as they were um, during the norming, during the forming stage rather. They're, um, their function is more as a coach to clarify. So they directed, they said what the big picture was when they were forming the team. Now they need to give some more meat to that. They need to clarify what does this mean? What's the purpose of this team? And what are our values? What are the norms? What behavior determines how we operate as a team and what we find acceptable? And, you know, our practices and what resources do we have available? And within the team, you know, who can do what? Understanding each other. So the, list, the leader as a coach is more a facilitator of open and honest dialogue because there will be conflict and what you want is for persons to talk about it, not for one to be aggressive and the other to withdraw, but for persons to have open and constructive dialogue about how we can resolve conflict. And so the leader acts as a facilitator of that to recognize and to encourage progress because low morale is happening now. Persons are not achieving what they expected to achieve, what they thought they would achieve. And so as the leader, you want to encourage and to recognize the progress that has been made, the things that they have done right, in spite of the dissatisfaction and the storm that is happening within the team, there are some things that are right and you want to recognize that. You want to develop the skill set of your team, whether it's interpersonal skills, how they relate to each other, or the actual task that they have to do, how to upskill them so that they can do it better than they're doing now. And then you want to encourage that. I know what person A beside me and person B to the other side of me brings to the table and they know what I bring to the table and we share our knowledge so everybody is more informed and better equipped to, to move this project along and to, and to be a high performing team. And then finally, the leader helps team members to appreciate the differences in others in, in that they understand that your opinion isn't the only opinion other persons have opinions which may or may not be more valuable than what you're saying in terms of moving something forward. So being open to ideas, because if I'm not interested in hearing what you have to say for whatever reason, I block, I close the space for creativity to occur in the team. And if everybody now thinks that only this person, John Brown or Avadon, are the only two persons who can contribute, then even if they have a brilliant idea, 
they're going to keep that to themselves because there's no space to share here. You don't value my difference of opinion. And so the leader, the role of the leader in the storming dissatisfaction phase is to help the team members to appreciate the different opinions that are in the room and to allow the space for creativity to occur. So this is stage two, the storming dissatisfaction state. The third stage is norming and integration. And this is where now the leaders start sharing their leadership and responsibility for the team to function. So persons now begin to get along and the leader, instead of being as directive and out there, now steps back and allows the team to do some things on their own, to function on their own, to have dialogue on their own. Persons have much greater clarity and commitment to their roles, their responsibilities, the norms of the group, the values of the group, the behavior that they are that is expected of them. And now that we've had this open dialogue, we are building trust. There's harmony, there's respect, there's unity, but also because we're now in this honeymoon phase, you know, we had a little rocky start and we're now in this honeymoon phase. What you do find is that persons don't want to rock the boat. And so you have a tendency to avoid conflict. Persons aren't sharing the way that they need to share. You know, we're all discussing and then one person is just quiet and you're wondering why. And they have a difference of opinion, but because everybody else seems to be on board with it, they don't want to be the naysayer. But as the leader, your role is to bring out that difference of opinion, get persons to talk about it so you understand what is a possible stumbling block maybe that we need to resolve before we move on with this issue. Or maybe you just come up with a better idea all together, right? That one person may have a better idea than everybody else in the room. And because of fear of rocking the boat and a tendency to avoid conflict, they went along with the group thing and missed that idea. The leader begins to allow the team to manage itself, to show that they can do things on their own. And by encouraging persons to speak up, by getting persons to share their differences, the differences of thought, right? What you avoid is groupthink. What you ag avoid is everybody just following what, what everybody else is saying and missing other things that you could do, that you could do differently, that you could do better. Missing the opportunity to pick out what could be the potential flaws in what you're doing and improving the process, you know. that So that's a big thing. One, you'll find that big decisions are made by the team and, you know, that the leader delegates small tasks initially. As we move into the productivity stage, you'll see where much more delegation happens. But right now, what the leader is doing is facilitating and enabling greater productivity, greater success, but still building on their skills, whether interpersonal skills or technical skills, so that they can have positive and trusting relationships. This is a norming integration stage. And then finally, we have the performing production stage. Well, there's actually the adjourning stage, which is a fifth stage, but that stage only occurs in teams that after the project has ended, they disband it. For teams that just continue, this we, we end at the performing production stage. And at this stage, persons are clear on their rules. They understand their purpose. They know their values. Everybody is on the same page from the same hymn book, singing in harmony. It's just beautiful. And when this happens, when persons have the right attitude, have the right values, have the right skills, the leader can delegate. The leader can give things to different members of the team and the team can manage itself. The leader doesn't even have to be present for the team to do what it needs to do because they have that clarity of vision, values, goals, roles, responsibilities, deliverables, accountables, all of these things. And what they have further developed is a, a, a system, right, where they have these empowering practices. They have ways that they speak to each other, ways that they make decisions, ways that they communicate. 
And because the relationships are strong, because they've worked through a few kinks, a few struggles, had a few headbutting, and they were able to have open and honest dialogue about it. Now, instead of focusing on not sharing or what will happen when you share and the conflict and the drama, they can now focus on overachieving because they have been successful and they're having optimal productivity and the standards that they set for themselves are high standards because they're now in sync. They understand each other. All the parts are connecting beautifully. They're moving together like a well-oiled machine and disagreements are not cause for concern and persons are tearing their hair out. On the contrary, disagreements are opportunities for creativity, opportunities for us to be better and to connect more and to grow. And then we have our successes, we have our productivity, we are doing things, we're achieving the things that we want to achieve and we celebrate both the individual contribution, so what I did, what person A did, what person B did, but also what the team collectively does. And when we recognize not just the team, but also the individuals on the team, we have high morale in this performing production stage of the team development. So as a leader, how do I know where my team is? What am I looking for? Well, I'm looking for communication, participation. Who are the persons talking? Is it the same person talking all the time? Are persons um, not talking at all? Are they not talking because they don't want to talk? Or are they not talking because they're not being given an opportunity to talk? What's the dynamic there? What's the process for decision making? Who makes a decision? Is it a situation where we discuss it or we have open dialogue? Or does the leader make the decision? What about conflict? How do we resolve conflict? What are the rules? You know, do we speak to persons however we feel like? Is there respect? How do we resolve in terms of listening? Do we listen? What do we do when we have conflict? So these are some of the things that we're looking at. Leadership. Is it one leader who is the leader all the way through and there is no shared responsibility at the leadership level as we saw in stage four where the leader doesn't even have to be there. They delegate, they oversee, but they delegate at a high level and then they look in and check in on whether or not things are happening and if they need to offer support. What happens in your group? right now? What about their goals and their roles in achieving those goals? Are your team members clear on what the goals are and what their specific role is in achieving that goal? Norms, what is the expected behavior from this team? What would you consider acceptable as for this group in terms of behavior, in terms of problem solving? How do we think through problems? How do we come to conclusions? How do we solve problems? Do we have a process? Do we have a way where we maybe go around and each person gives their thought on it? Or maybe we go in little groups and we work really hard and then we come together and we see which of the different options that are presented. How do we solve problems? And then there's the climate. How do we feel? How does it feel to be a part of this team? What is the dynamic? What is the environment like? Is there tension or is there joy? Are people happy or are they stressed out? Are they angry? Are they miserable? Are they delighted to do their work? Is there a joyous atmosphere? What is the climate like when you got, go into your team meetings? Is it so tense that you could slice the air? And then you look at the individual behavior. How is each individual contributing to the goal, to the team? How are they participating? How are they being? What are they doing? Are they being and feeling and being involved as a part of the team? Or are they kind of on the side just doing their own thing? So as the team leader, I want you to observe your team. Think about what is going on, observe their behavior, and then make a determination about where you think your team is in the stages of team development. Is your team at the, at the forming orientation stage? Are they at the 
storming dissatisfaction stage or the norming stage or the production stage where are they and how are they functioning how are they doing what are how are they performing as a team so when we're at the different stages how do i need to be as a leader so we in stage one we spoke about you know this is a new team and there is high anxiety low trust persons are not really sure and this requires what we call a directing style and this is from the situational leadership model and in the directing style it's kind of like you have a school of thought this is how Blanchard describes it you have a school of thought where children are thought to be empty barrels and you want to fill them with knowledge well at the at the forming orientation stage they are unclear about so many things they don't know what their purpose is they don't know what their vision is their values their roles their norms the decision making communication styles problem solving there's so much that they don't know and as the leader your role is to fill their barrel with the knowledge of what is the goal what are the values what is the expected behavior what is their role to achieve this vision that's what you do when the, when the team is at the forming orientation stage as a leader you provide that knowledge for them so that they can start to understand what it is that they need to do and be to achieve these things you have to create that space and that for them when we get to the second stage which is a storming dissatisfaction stage now you're not just giving direction and telling them what to do you're allowing them to start interacting with each other and and, and you know having the, the 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 battle the struggle as it were for the power for the authority for saying that I did this or for blaming somebody else and when that is happening you are there as the leader to give coaching about how we do things how we have dialogue with persons so you're giving them direction still clarifying things for them but now you're also supporting them and helping them to process in the norming integration stage they have the information that they need they know what they need to do they have greater much greater clarity about the vision and the values and their role and their responsibilities and the things that you want to hold them accountable for and what the norms are but now you need to help them to organize it so it's a lot of things that is in the head but how do I apply it to what needs to be done right now in this team for this result your role now is to be there in a supportive role to help them to put it together so that they can perform optimally and finally we get to the performing production stage where now people know what they need to know you fill the barrel you've organized the barrel they understand what is required of them what is their specific role how they're going to achieve things now you need to say john you're doing x tom you're doing y linda you're doing z and allow them to to manage themselves and to get things done you are delegating and what you're really just getting is report and when needed your thoughts your opinion on how they're doing things and whether that's really the way we want it to go and if you want it to go in a different direction you give your thoughts on that as well so in the performing stage the leader is is you know in training we say that if you're doing a good job most of your time you're sipping tea while you're watching in this case that's what the leader would be doing they're sipping tea while the team is doing what needs to be done so based on the stage that your group is actually did you, which you did in the exercise previously what style of leadership would you say is most appropriate for them what style of leadership would you need to apply in order to get your team to be its best to be performing at its top level? And while you're thinking about that, I want to talk to you about what is your homework assignment? I want you, having identified what stage your group is at, having identified the style of leadership that you need to execute, I want you in the next three days to implement that style of leadership with your team. And as you implement it, observe 
what are the specific actions that you took and what's the impact of those actions how is what you're doing working or not working how is what you're doing really helping your team and when i see you i want you to share with me what those specific actions are that you took and the impact of those actions and this is for our friday coaching session so implement the appropriate leadership style with your team for the next three days but be prepared to share your specific actions that you took and the impact of those actions with your team members so until next time from us at the influence hub to your unlimited possibilities bye bye